From the 3rd century all the way to the early 7th century, Byzantium and the Sasanian Persian Empire had fought wars with one another, but most of these wars have been relatively indecisive. These wars have been on a great scale, but neither side had been in a position to truly gain a major advantage on the other side, at least one which would fundamentally alter the nature of their relationship. However, the Byzantine-Sasanian War of 602 to 628, which is one of the most poorly named wars of all time, given its significance, would change all that. This is a case when both empires came to the brink of destruction and put all in for the war effort. So, without any further ado, let's talk about how this war started and cover the course of this conflict. From 582 to 602, the Byzantines had been under the Emperor Maurice, who was an excellent general, but who may have been a bit tone deaf when it came to social unrest at home. Well, when he ordered his army to camp north of the Danube in the winter of 602, the general Phocas led the men in the mutiny, and when combined with the forces of the Blues and the Greens and some disgruntled senators, they were able to kill Maurice and his family and then declared Phocas as the new emperor. Well, the problem is that even though Phocas had a lot of support early on, there was a lot of dissension among the Byzantines as a whole, and Phocas was never really able to establish himself as the legitimate ruler of the Byzantine Empire. Um, some senators would kind of turn on him after supporting him, the Blues and the Greens were not completely reliable, and the Greens would go from being his biggest supporters to his biggest enemies, and he would try to punish them to no avail. Um, there also were various conspiracies and coups against Phocas, um, so he had a lot of problems that he was never able to deal with. And one other problem that he inherited is that back in 591 or 590, Chosro II had been installed as king of Persia by Maurice. So now Chosro has a reasonable um, pretext for invading Byzantium to avenge Maurice. And this is how the war gets started. If you know anything about Persian dynastic politics, then Chosro's motives for invading Rome at this time should not be hard to figure out. Back when he had been installed by Maurice, he was only 20, but now he is a mature man of 32, and he wants to do away with his old reputation as a puppet to the Byzantine Emperor. Well, he had no real desire to fight Maurice, Maurice had helped him after all, and Maurice was a renowned and accomplished general. Now that there was dissension in Byzantium, Chosro saw a chance to attack and regain some of the land that he had had to give to Maurice as part of the treaty they signed following Maurice's intervention on his behalf. So this is a great opportunity and it will also make sure that he is seen as legitimate and as a true warrior in the eyes of aristocrats around him who might assassinate him if they didn't respect him. So this is an excellent opportunity for him to really rewrite his own history. It, this is sort of his moment, like, um, if you're familiar with William the Conqueror, before he conquered England, he was William the Bastard. And this is basically Chosro's moment, except that his conquest of England, eh, doesn't quite go according to plan. Now, um, the Byzantine army had divided loyalties because Maurice did have some loyalists in the army, even if there were people who were angry at his strict discipline. There were some generals who had been appointed or promoted by Maurice, or who believed in his um, strict discipline. So this was something that Chosros could exploit. And there was also a rivalry between the Balkan army and the Eastern army, since the Eastern army had backed Phocas, and the, uh, I mean the Balkan army had backed Phocas, and the Eastern army had had no say in it. So there are some seams for Chosros to exploit. And early on, Chosros is able to take a few major fortified centers in Mesopotamia and gain some parts of Armenia. Now, that's not spectacular, but it is pretty good. For the most part, these fortified cities hardly ever fall, and normally you just ravage the land, the land around it, and you go home happy if you're the Persians. But for Chosros, he's he has one secret weapon. And you might wonder, well, what is that weapon? Earlier I mentioned that Phocas had executed Maurice and all of his sons. 
And that was a fairly sensible precaution, because if any of these sons had survived, then they could have competed for the throne, and they would have certainly had at least some soldiers who were still loyal to the memory of Maurice. Well, there was a rumor that Maurice had sent his eldest son, Theodosius, who was a teenager, out to inspect the east, and that this Theodosius was in the custody of the general Narses, who hated Focas and wanted to restore the dynasty of Maurice. So, this story has been held up to suspicion. A lot of people don't believe that there actually was um, a Prince Theodosius out east, and certainly the narrative from Heraclius is that this is not true and that this person was an imposter. However, if you're Narses or the Persians, this story is 100% true. I don't want to weigh in on whether it's true or not. It actually doesn't really matter. Um, now, because this Theodosius was paraded in front of uh, a lot of Byzantine garrisons, some of them just surrendered their cities to the Persians because they thought that they would work with these Persians to restore Theodosius. Um, and the problem is this great tool does help uh, Chosros to take many early uh, settlements, but this Theodosius dies in 606 at a young age, but then Chosro turns around and says, well, he might have died, but there's still a dynasty of Maurice because Theodosius um, had some lovers and he fathered some children. So, Marie, uh, Chosro, till the end of the war, would continue to press the claim for the House of Maurice, although this claim was weaker by um, you know, the time that this Theodosius died. However, keep in mind that um, he had already taken a few of the major fortified centers that the Sasanians never got past. So he's already got a good position, and he's already made some major gains in this war, even if these are not necessarily spectacular or um, earth-shattering achievements, they're still pretty good and it put him in a very strong position to negotiate a peace settlement or extract an indemnity, or at the bare minimum readjust his frontier favorably to his own side. So earlier I mentioned that Phocas had never quite established himself as legitimate in Byzantium, and because of that he faced multiple conspiracies and at first he responded fairly moderately and he didn't um, go after anyone he didn't have to go after but as these conspiracies kept mounting and it became clear that nearly every aristocrat in the city saw him as vulnerable and wanted to pick him off he did become much harsher and he started engaging in more and more judicial murders and as he killed more and more senators they began to feel persecuted which then inspired more conspiracies so it became a never-ending cycle and one of these conspiracies was by a guy named Germanus, who we've met in the past. He is one of the last surviving members of the Justinian dynasty, and he will launch a conspiracy in conjunction with the widow of Maurice. That will fail, and then, um, you know, Phocas will have to eliminate many of the women of the Maurice dynasty as well as the last of the Justinian dynasty. And, of course, that then makes him even more of a boogeyman. So, in, in a lot of ways, this isn't really his fault. This is just, um, you know, that he failed to establish legitimacy and that no one respected him sufficiently. And because of that, he had no choice but to use force to maintain himself in power and keep his head on his shoulders. Now, this would have been a great opportunity for any of the Western exarchs to intervene. There are commanders in Italy and Spain who have troops, and especially in Italy, However, uh, they're bogged down with plenty of their own problems. Both of them are under heavy pressure, and in fact, by the year 620, the Byzantine forces in Spain will be expelled altogether, so these commanders have no ability to send some of their troops to Constantinople to try to install a new emperor. The one guy who has a relative amount of peace and also has an army of about 15,000 men is the Exarch of Africa named Heraclius, a very experienced administrator in general. And he's good friends with Phocas's number two in command named Priscus. So Priscus asks Heraclius to intervene, and Heraclius agrees. The Exarch Heraclius and his son, who's also named Heraclius, are now in pursuit of imperial power. And this is a bit of a problem for Phocas. Phocas. 
Now, one thing that the two men named Heraclius have going for them is that there's a clear line of succession. Um, the younger Heraclius is about 30, and he's a big, vigorous guy who um, has enough experience to be effective and also has an imposing physique and has a lot of energy. Whereas Phocas at this point is already in his 50s and has no clear heir. His heir is Priscus. Uh, Phocas himself has no children. So that in itself means that Phocas looks vulnerable, whereas the older Heraclius has someone to back him up, and that's a point of strength in his favor. So the strategy pursued by the two Heraclii is that they will cut off the grain from Constantinople to really put the pressure on Phocas. So the younger Heraclius and his uh, generals go to Egypt and they meet up with anti-Phocas officials who had been, you know, in power under Maurice, and they manage to cut off the grain supply from Alexandria to Constantinople. Well, obviously that creates a lot of problems in the city, and it's a city which has already had many problems with rioting in the past. Now, because of this, Phocas can't allow his city to starve, so he has to withdraw some of his troops from the east who are still being pressed hard by Chosroes. And this means that the eastern frontier gets a lot weaker, and, um, spoiler, Phocas does not succeed in defeating Heraclius. So it ended up being all for naught. In Egypt in early 610, Heraclius gets word that his strategy of starving the city has produced the expected results, and that the population is really turning on Phocas, so he decides to make a fairly ballsy move and he gathers his fleet together and they make for Constantinople. Now it's dangerous to sail in the winter, even in a calm sea like the Mediterranean, the water's a lot rougher. Not only that, but Phocas would have had naval superiority, he would have had a much larger fleet, and he would have had the advantage of having a much uh, more secured port. However, Phocas's men were not necessarily that inspired to fight for him, and um, it was actually a lot harder than you might think for ancient and medieval fleets to intercept each other. All you had to do was go along a path that was not expected, and you could avoid detection pretty easily. It happens over and over, and it's actually more the exception than the rule when a fleet gets caught. Anyway, um, so what Heraclius does is as he's sailing towards the city, uh, he's ready to assault, but it ends up being not unnecessary because the crowd on March 3rd arrests Phocas, kills most of his um, you know, associates, and then hands him over to Heraclius when Heraclius arrives on March 5th. Now, Phocas is thrown on the deck of Heraclius' ship, and Heraclius demands to know if this is what Phocas considered to be good government. And Phocas sneeringly responds that um, he hopes that Heraclius will govern better. And Heraclius then, you know, has him executed, has a hero's welcome, everything seems great. Um, but Heraclius knows that the one major failing of both Phocas and Maurice was not sufficiently ingratiating themselves. So rather than rushing to the frontier with his army and trying to restore order there, he instead tries to really spend the first several years of his reign really ingratiating himself with the people in Senate and Rome to avoid more coups and conspiracies. So his first wife will sire two offspring, and then she'll die in 612. He'll take another wife who happens to be his niece, and he will also appear in church quite a bit and try to really establish a reputation for great piety. Um, as the war continues to worsen, he will try to keep the Avars at bay by paying them off with increasingly heavy indemnities, and he'll also try to fund the war in the east, which is going horribly, and to do that, he will actually have to burn, melt down a lot of church treasures, and luckily for him, the patriarch at the time, Sergius, was basically his BFF, so this was something he was able to do, but it probably was not all that popular. Heraclius actually may have been wise to spend his first few years trying to restore order in the capital and ingratiate himself and ensure a line of succession. However, things were not going well in the east. The Byzantine generals were mostly on the losing side. They won a few battles, but when they would lose cities, those cities would remain lost and they weren't able to recapture them. This means that they were getting weaker. They were losing revenue and bases. So 
this it means that Heraclius was under some pressure. However, the situation was stable even if it was a losing effort. Now, Heraclius did empower Priscus, who he had um, also hired after the fall of Phocas, and Priscus had a great plan to try to trap a Persian army at Caesarea by opening the city to the Persians, then besieging it. However, this plan failed. It was a good plan, didn't quite work though. And what this does is it does enable Heraclius to eliminate a huge rival because then he manages to pin the blame all on Priscus and label him as incompetent and make him retire to a monastery. Had Priscus succeeded, however, Heraclius would have also won because then he would have won a major victory and destroyed one of the two or three major Persian field armies and then been able to threaten the Persians in the rear. Didn't happen, though. So, after Priscus is removed, Heraclius' generals continue to fight, and after about 613 or so, the speed of failure picks up dramatically. Um, the city of Caesarea falls, and that exposes Anatolia, which is one of the recruitment heartlands of the Byzantine Empire. Um, and it also leads to the fall and sack of Antioch, the third city of the empire, and the capital of Syria. So, this means that now this... Um, rate of failure is really picking up. And probably the biggest blo single blow in terms of strategic importance is when the city of Alexandria in Egypt falls in 619 because that was the second city of the empire. And it is very possible that when the city fell in 619 that that is when the library was burned. Most people try to blame it on the Arab invasions but it could have been at this point as well or it could have even happened after the Arab conquest. Uh, just because of a random fire and lack of maintenance. It's hard to say. So anyway, things couldn't really be much worse than they are right now in about 619 or so. From a strategic standpoint, the fall of Jerusalem was not the greatest of the many disasters which befell Heraclius. However, from a symbolic standpoint, it really did undermine his credibility and severely damaged Byzantine and Christian morale. So the Persian general Shabaraz, who is probably the best of the Persian generals, even better than Chosro himself, was just fresh off of his victories at Antioch and Caesarea, and he decides to lay siege to Jerusalem. The city lasts only a month, and in April or so of 614 it falls. Now, the Persians had been partly aided by the Jewish community, Back in the 7th century, the Jewish communities of a lot of these eastern cities are large enough to actually fight back against the Christian communities, and sometimes these uh, two factions are able to massacre one another in turn. So this is one of the few times that we know of where the Jewish community got the upper hand on the Christians. Um, the True Cross is taken from the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, and is removed to Ctesiphon, where it's given over to the Church of the East. So the Nestorian Christians and others who had fled from Byzantium over the centuries were really elated that now they were the holders of the true cross, because this really sort of, in their minds, justified all of their actions, and also you know, meant that they were now the more legitimate Christians rather than the Orthodox Chalcedonians. Now, because the Jewish community had had a big role in taking the city for Persia and then governing it on Persia's behalf, there was a lot of anti-Jewish sentiment in Constantinople and other uh, cities still under Byzantine control. So this you know, creates a lack of unity among the Byzantine subjects and will lead to even more street violence and thus urban decline. Now, Heraclius, who had just remarried to his niece a couple years before, um, is accused of being impious because of this. And a lot of people wonder, well, is he secretly a pervert? Is he someone who has lost favor with God? Because Jerusalem hasn't fallen to a foreign foe in many, many years. And in fact, uh, the last time that Jerusalem had not been Roman was when um, it had revolted against the Romans, I guess. But if you're talking about falling to an outside foreign power, the last time that Jerusalem had been in the hands of anyone other than Rome was prior to uh, Pompey the Great back in 65 BCE. So over 600 years, the city had been in Roman or Byzantine hands. 
and this is a tremendous blow. This is as much of a gut check to the Byzantines as the sack of Rome in 410 was to the Western Roman Empire. By 618, things had gotten bad enough that Heraclius actually sent envoys to negotiate a peace settlement with the Persians, and in this peace settlement, Heraclius was willing to yield Syria and Palestine. His armies were too divided to really launch an effective counterattack. He had armies left over holding the frontier in Anatolia to some degree, and he had armies in Egypt and then a fleet, but things were pretty dire and he didn't really like his odds all that well. And uh, for the most part, it looks like the Persian generals were in favor of this agreement. This would leave them permanently stronger than the Byzantines, and it would constitute the greatest victory in Sasanian history. However, Chosroes did not feel the same way. Now, while the Persian generals pointed out that the Byzantine armies were still in the field and they were still viable even if they had been beaten and weakened, Chosro thought that he was going to go for the full thing. He was at a crossroads where he could take a lot and be a great ruler, but he thought that if he kept pressing on, he might defeat Byzantium completely and then go on to be the greatest Persian ruler since Cyrus the Great back in the 6th century BCE. So he decided to strive for greatness, and he pushed forward. And um, the way he did that was with a little bit of style, I guess. He imprisoned and starved the envoys, and after they all died, he then ordered an invasion of Egypt, which at first looked like it was going to be a hard fight, but it actually really wasn't. Uh, they took Egypt fairly quickly, and also he managed to break through Anatolia and push all the way up to... Um, the coast of Chalcedon facing Byzant uh, Constantinople relatively quickly. So at first it looked like he had made a brilliant decision and that he was going to be you know, the Persian Alexander the Great. There's a pretty good reason why the second golden age of Sasanian history is normally ended at the year 622, and that's because 622 was the year when Chosro II was at the height of his power and it looked like Persia might actually not only heavily defeat Byzantium, but also annex the majority or even the entirety of its eastern holdings and forever um, change the balance of power in the world. Um, by 622, Chosro and his generals had overrun most of Anatolia, Egypt, and Syria. So basically all the areas of the empire which produced revenue were now in the hands of the Persians. This meant that there was a major financial crisis for Heraclius. We'll talk about that later. At the same time, um, Heraclius had been trying to buy off the Avars. Um, and at first, the Avars and Slavs were still weakened from the beatings they had taken at the hands of Maurice, you know, not many years before. But several years had passed, and now they're recovered. And they realize that the Byzantines are able to just pay them off and... Uh, you know, they're willing to do so to get men to the east, that the Byzantines must be very weak. So the Avars and the Slavs, under a new Avar Kagan, we don't actually know his name, Kagan is just the title he had, invade heavily. And they really do start to settle and overthrow the existing population. We see that most of the major cities in the Balkans fall to the Avars or the Slavs by about the year 620. And even in places where there's still some Byzantine control, it's not really all that safe to farm because of Avar cavalry raids trying to intimidate these populations into full submission. Uh, the, outside of the capital itself, there is some land the Byzantines still control um, for several miles, maybe all the way up to Thessalonica. There are Greek islands that haven't been touched, and then there are some coastal cities in Greece and in the Western Balkans that are still holding out. However, for the most part, the Balkans are completely lost, and this, up to this point, had been the chief recruiting ground of the Byzantine Empire. The failure here and the overrun of the Balkans by the Avars and Slavs will actually be so severe that in, for a few centuries later, uh, the Byzantines will have to do the majority of their recruitment from Anatolia rather than the Balkans. This will forever change the composition of the Byzantine army. Uh, even after this crisis is resolved. Desperate times call for desperate measures, and while this is often a cliche that gets misused, in this case it applies 
Heraclius was at his wit's end and he was pulling out every stop to survive. In 616, he cut the pay for his army and his bureaucracy by half. Um, and he also began minting silver coins to pay his army. Now, normally, you would use gold coins for this, but he needed to save those gold coins for major purchases. So, these silver coins, though, when they were printed, they're called the hexagram coins. The inscription reads, May God help the Romans. Um, you know, pretty good sign of the times, I would think. And the most shocking thing that he did is he ended the Anona, the old free grain dole, which dated back all the way to the Gracchi brothers in the Roman Republic. Um, they instituted this, or Gaius Gracchus did, in 123 BCE. And it is this grain dole which enabled the city of Rome at its peak to grow to 1.5 million, and which enabled Constantinople to reach about a million people in its prime. Now, while Constantinople had lost some population over the years, it was still a mega city. It's hard to really estimate how many people it would have had maybe close to a million still. But after this, um, there was a large percentage of population uh, dependent on this grain dole, and they pretty much just had to leave, and most of them tried to go to Thrace to find work on farms. However, as we've seen, the Balkans are also collapsing, so there's not any safety for them, and it looks like this was a humanitarian crisis which resulted in the deaths of countless Byzantine citizens. The city of Constantinople after this war and then after the subsequent Arab invasions would shrink to around 50 to maybe 80,000 people. And while that would still be one of the biggest cities of this time, it was nothing like what it had been before the grain dole got cut. So this is another in a series of uh, you know events where old Roman institutions and vestiges are disappearing and Byzantium is inc becoming increasingly medieval. Now, in 622, um, Heraclius decided that he had to take the field himself. Um, you know, he could see the Persians across the straits at Chalcedon, pretty much. Uh, the Balkans were falling apart. Italy had had a, a brief revolt from 616 to 617, which one of his generals had dealt with. So things are pretty damn bad. He had even thought at one point perhaps it was a ruse to get people to agree to his uh, budget cuts, but he had proposed moving the capital to Carthage at one point. And that could have just been a ruse to trick people into acquiescing to his demands, or maybe it was even just pure desperation. I don't know. But either way, Heraclius uh, took what remained of the Byzantine field army and then left the capital in the hands of his good friend, the patriarch Sergius. And he decided to attack near the Caucasus and try to avoid the main Persian field armies and open up a front in their rear. Well, um, this actually worked relatively well. He made some allies with some Turkic groups, and please do not ask me to explain what Turkic groups are. I might try to do that in a future video. But basically, that's just sort of a broad label which describes people from the um, steppes of what is now Russia and further east. And he made an alliance with them and began pushing in on Persian holdings, retaking some land. Um, so he's both in the Caucasus and in what's now like northeast Turkey. And by 626, he's made some progress. I mean, it's nothing dramatic, but he has taken a few cities. He's won a few battles. You know, so he's making some noise. And Chazro is getting a bit testy about it. And he wants to really remove the thorn in his rear. So he has to up the ante now. Chosro decided that the best way to try to draw Heraclius back to his own capital was to attack it. So in 626, the Persians on the eastern side of the Bosporus and then the Avars and Slavs decided to work together to lay a grand siege to Constantinople. Um, now against the advice of a lot of people, Heraclius actually decides to stay up north and continue his campaign. He does send a handful of reinforcements, but for the most part, he's pretty confident in Constantinople's ability to hold out. Um, with only two exceptions, Constantinople withstood every siege, and most of them were not close calls. Um, it was the best fortified city in the Middle Ages, and um, if it was properly manned until the invention of gunpowder, it was more or less invincible. Um, so. The Persians want to ferry over to the European side of the Straits and then help the Slavs and Avars. The 
the Persians, of course, have all the siege equipment and, and knowledge that uh, their friends lack. So um, the Persians don't really have much of a navy, so they rely on the Slavs to come pick them up. Well, the Slavs get there, they pick up Persians, and they're returning, and then the Byzantine fleet manages to intercept them. The Byzantine fleet, even though it probably hasn't been properly maintained in several years at this point because of budget problems, uh, is still able to cut these ships down and, uh, you know, probably sends a lot of men to the bottom. So that's pretty demoralizing for the Persians, because then you have men who die just trying to move from place to place. Um, one uh, exception to the naval interception thing I said earlier is that you can actually see across the straits. So if you can see what you're you know, trying to intercept, it becomes a lot easier. And the Byzantines had way better ships from what we can tell. So that was a pretty bad failure, and the Persians don't even play a part in the siege that they themselves called for, more or less. So the Avars got fairly um, anxious. The, the Kagan, who was a really influential figure, actually mounts two or three direct assaults, and all of these assaults fail, as you might expect. It's possible that the losses he incurred in that those assaults really helped weaken the Avars going forward, and, you know, ultimately might have helped the Slavs break away from them. I don't know, that's just speculation. Uh, when you assault the walls and fail, it usually means you lost a lot of dudes. Anyway, by 627... Heraclius has caused enough damage that um, Chosro himself decides to pull back his army and deal with Heraclius back in the east. So that is what ends the siege because I think the Persians were the ones bankrolling the operation. It wasn't really all that practical for the Slavs and Avars. Um, they had not taken Thessalonica, the other major city in the Balkans that the Byzantines held. And without that in their possession, they were getting hit in the rear by raids and stuff. So, you know, once the Persian bankrollers and suppliers drop out, it's over, pretty much. Without getting into the nitty-gritty of what Heraclius did during this campaign, um, suffice it to say, he only had one field army, and had he been beaten at any one point, it would have probably been all over, and he'd have had to try something else, or surrender, or, you know... M you know, settle for a very much tiny Byzantine Empire that would have faded into obscurity. So, every battle he fought was pretty much an existential fight, and he managed to win them all. If you're a Persian general, you also understood that Heraclius only has one army. If you beat that, you win the war, and you're a great hero. So, there were several generals who were willing to give it a shot, and they all failed. Every time Heraclius won a battle, it strengthened him. It allowed him to take territory, strengthen his army and raise morale more generally. So, the perfectly reasonable strategy of trying to fight and beat Heraclius head-on ended up costing the Persians pretty drastically in the end. Now, he had been messing around in the peripheries of things that the Persians cared about. It was still a you know form of harassment, and he was still beating Persian armies, but it wasn't really a major threat, and he was still fighting on what had been his own territory prior to the outbreak of the war. So, you know, he's still, still overall, Persia's clearly winning the war, no question. But in December of 626, Heraclius, rather than retreating into winter quarters, does a surprise attack on northern Mesopotamia, and now he's fighting on Sasanian territory and not Roman territory that had been overrun by the Sasanians years earlier. So, as he continues to lay waste to Persian lands, and he's taking cities, and he's got more allies from the steppes, uh, Chosro II decides that he has no choice but to defend his homeland because now he's taking damage and if he's allowing his homeland to be raided while he's you know, off uh, trying to take Constantinople on some clearly hopeless quest, then it really undermines his prestige. So he decides that he's going to face Heraclius personally and put an end to all this and finally win the war. From December of 626 until September of 627, Heraclius continues to work his way down Mesopotamia, taking cities, winning small battles, and generally damaging lands that belong to the Persian crown. Finally, um, Heraclius and the Shahan Shah Chazros II meet at the old city of Nineveh, which is now in ruins. It once was a great city for the Assyrians and they fight a battle that turns out to be the decisive battle of the war. Now during this battle, 
as things are going against the Sasanians, one of Chazro's generals actually rides out and challenges Heraclius to a personal combat. And Heraclius, who by this point would have had to be at least in his late 50s, actually accepted. And surprisingly, Heraclius won. And when he won, that really broke the morale of the Persians, and it resulted in a rout. Now, it is possible that this defeat was nowhere near decisive, really. Um, it looks like the Persian army was still more or less intact. They were just disorganized and demoralized. So Chazro retreated to Iran, and he figured in the meantime, Ctesiphon could hold out. Uh, Heraclius would arrive there soon, and then he would come with his own army, relieve the siege, and everything would be cool. The problem is the army is really mad. They've been having the campaign away from home and occupied territory for years, and by trying to strive for too much and rejecting that peace offer that would have given them Syria and Palestine, they've lost a grand opportunity and now their homeland is being ravaged. So they mutiny, and then they imprison and starve Chazros II and put his son in power. And this new Shahan Shah is now forced to accept a peace agreement, and when they consult Heraclius to ask what he wants, he just says, let's just go back to the way things were. Let's restore the borders to what they were before the outbreak of the war, and I'm going to need my captured relics like the true cross back. Also, you're going to have to pay me a war indemnity, but nothing too heavy, because I just want to make sure you guys accept these terms. The Persians say, okay, and that ends the war. So on the map, you would think nothing happened, but looks can be deceiving. Two major conflicts which would have great implications for world history ended in the year 628 CE. One of them was the Byzantine-Sasanian War of 602 to 628, which ended in a Byzantine victory, at least in theory. And the other was the war between Mecca and Medina, where the Muslim community in Medina under Muhammad forced Mecca to capitulate and thus established itself as the new power to beat in Arabia. Um, the problem for the Byzantines and Sasanians is that both empires saw their core territories, the ones they rely on for recruitment and revenue, devastated. So this means that these empires are now poorer, weaker, and less populous than they had been going into the war. Both sides have imperial armies that are battered and demoralized. Um, neither side is fully up to strength. It's very unlikely that the quality of these armies is anywhere near what it was pre-war. And the Sasanian Persian Empire, we've already talked about it in a previous video, there was a major leadership crisis. Um, Chazros II's son came to power. He died pretty quickly. There were two women rulers, which was an unprecedented thing. Um, normally, women in Sasanian society didn't hold a very high position. Um, but they were only members of the House of Sasan who were around. And then a 16-year-old boy named Yazdegerd III emerged from hiding. He takes over in 632. And, you know, he'll never really have time to find his footing. And in Byzantium, what we see is that because the Byzantine church had made so many sacrifices and melted down church treasure, and um, some of the victories at Thessalonica were really central to the uh, you know continuation of Byzantium in the Balkans. Uh, a lot of these victories were attributed to saints, so Byzantium becomes even more Christianized, if that makes sense. And um, you know the, the power of the church there will become more prevalent, which means that the Byzantines will now have a bit of a predilection to see some wars as being holy wars. Obviously, you know, we'll see that that has a pretty predictable impact if you have any idea of what happens next in history. And the Byzantines don't really have a leadership crisis since Heraclius is a hero, but Heraclius himself is on the decline. At this point, he's an older guy, and because he's had to make such tremendous exertions, he doesn't really have a lot left in the tank. A lot of people like to cite Heraclius as a guy who whose position in world history would be so much stronger had he simply died around 628 or maybe, you know, around 630 or so. But he actually survives only as 641, and he'll preside over some more problems for the Empire, and this time he won't be able to figure out any solutions because his mental and physical health will be failing. 
And if you're wondering what this great event coming up is, it's called the Arab Conquest, and it will be the subject of our next video.